Santa got high, now everything is funny. Someone had a gummy, he thought he might try. His mouth is so dry, his teeth are kind of itchy. How'd he ever get so high? Ho, 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 just a taste of a yummy gummy. Ho, 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 yum, yum in my rummy gummy. Ho, 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 gum, gum, tummy, funny gummy. Oh, God, everybody knows. Welcome to Babylon Over Brews. Deep thoughts fermented over time and text. I'm coming at you, Aaron Crude Juice Viverka, and I've got Gumby. Hey, what's happening? I've got Sam. So, and I've got Ed. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> We're gonna be talking about Evil Season One. I'm excited. Well, before we start that, we're gonna be uh, sipping. On a little bit of God's beautiful mead. <laughs> By the way, how was it going, Gumby? That's good. Everything's going good. Keeping busy. Uh, I'm enjoying spring in Cleveland. Is that what this is? Is that what we're experiencing? <laughs> I guess traditionally, yeah, but not really spring. Yeah, the day of spring. <laughs> That's what Jim Gaffigan calls it. It's like, it's such a scam. So we've got, from Western Reserve Meadery, B. Baller. Hot pepper mead crafted from Carolina reaper peppers and cranberry blossom honey. Named for a natural defense mechanism where honeybees form a living ball of bees around an intruder and cook them with their body heat. Bee Baller balances heat, sweetness, and fruity floral notes from cranberry and blossom honey. It's an ABV of 15%, and this particular bottle comes from Forest City Meadery over in Ohio City. Mm. So, thank you, Forest City. Thank you very much. <laughs> Salute. Cheers. Ooh, smell that on the top. Ooh, that is very floral. I mm-hmm. got the heat. <laughs> mm. It's got that kick right in the forefront. Oh man! Oof. Yeah, you're getting that little bit of uh, that yeah, the bite reaper right in there. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. that reaper yeah. hits you right up front. It's like apple juice, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Norse people would call this, you know, the the blood of the gods or the drink of the gods. You know, mead. I've always enjoyed a good mead. It, it's it's a little bit more floral than a standard beer. Even a l- little more floral than most wines. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit fruity. Um, one of my favorite scenes from, do uh, you remember The 13th Warrior? Anybody? Anto- uh, I saw it a long time ago. All right. <laughs> I know the movie you're referring to. <laughs> yeah. Antonio Banderas. He's mm-hmm. playing uh, an Islamic guy uh, that's going out to accompany these Norse warriors. It was the 90s, all right? So, <laughs> and, yeah, uh, <laughs> you old folk. And he's like, uh, he, he looks to them, and they're all standing around the campfire, and they're drinking, and they offer him some, and he's like, ah, oh, I cannot drink. I'm Islamic. I cannot have drink of the vine or of the barley. And they start laughing and laughing, and Antonio Bandars looks at them, you know, cross-eyed, like, what are you, why, why are you laughing? <laughs> and they're like, it's mead. It's honey. <laughs> so then he takes a big swig. <laughs> there you go. So this is great, though. I like the way it tastes. It's good, right? I like it more than it smells. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, well, that's good. And then it tastes just it just tastes good to you. Then. That's so. It's. It's got that nice, like thick flavor to it. That that's mm-hmm. that's mead, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's it's. It's fermented from honey, so it, it's a little bit thicker than most wines. Yeah, yeah, but it's smooth. I like that bite, that that uh, that thick um, reaper pepper. Yeah, yeah, it's infused. You actually can uh, taste it a little bit, but the bite up front, it's baller. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's did, good. Did you say the ABU on this? Yep, fifteen percent. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is that's no joke right please <laughs> imbibe in the devil's drink <laughs> again it's the fruit of the gods 
So we're talking about tonight, evil. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yep. And we're only going to be talking about season one right now because season one and season two are distinctly different in some ways. And that's why we'll, that's what we'll be going over tonight. So before we dive into the episodes, um, anybody want to tell or speak about their general impressions of the show? Sam? I know it's been a while, but... <laughs> so, the first season, it seemed like it was very, very, uh, Muller and Scully, very science versus psychology versus religion aspect of will they, won't they believe, how do they believe, and the I want to believe mm. aspect of it. There was always that inkling in the back of your mind saying... I know something's going on. I just can't quite explain it yet. Yeah. Yeah. So let me read the about page real quick, just to fill any listeners in that haven't watched it yet. One of the reasons I wanted to do this, this episode is because I found out there are a lot of people out there that didn't even know the show existed. And I really think it's a very well scripted show. So and, uh, where can we watch the show? It's on Paramount Plus. So, in fact, season two was exclusively Paramount Plus, whereas season one was on network TV. Okay. So, uh, evil is a psychological mystery that examines the origins of evil along the dividing line between science and religion. The series focuses on a skeptical female psychologist who joins a priest in training and a contractor as they investigate the church's backlog of unexplained mysteries, including supposed miracles, demonic possessions, and hauntings. Their job is to assess if there is a logical explanation or if something truly supernatural is at work. <laughs> and you're right. It, it did have a very uh, Sculler, Mulder, uh, X-Files type feel to it from like a church perspective. Like a, a X-Files slash... Um... Twilight Zone sort of feeling. Yeah, I'd almost say, almost like Fringe. They all, they all, yes. Oh, yeah. I love that show. <laughs> Fringe was so good. So the, it shows, so the, the psychologist is Katya Herbers, is Dr. Kristen Bouchard, a forensic psychologist hired by David Acosta to help him distinguish between legitimate instances of demonic possession and insanity. Kristen is not religious and does not believe in demons or the supernatural, but finds her skeptical tested many times as she walks a thin line between what science can account for and what it has yet to explain. And her character is very interesting because she was Catholic growing up. Mm -hmm. She's a lapsed cap Catholic. Yeah. You see it so much. <laughs> <laughs> she is not like any other religion. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> uh, Mike Coulter as David Acosta, former journalist. And mind you, I'm also going to bring up the fact that he plays Luke Cage, <laughs> a former journalist studying to be a Catholic priest. He currently works as an assessor tasked with an investigating and confirming events such as miracles and reports of demons. He takes hallucinogens in order to see visions, but he is not sure if they are from God or his own mind. Now, they still haven't gone fully into what his first vision was. Even into season two, they they kind of play a little bit to what it could be, but they still really haven't said what it is. There may be spoilers said tonight, because I, I can't remember what is where. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, because he sees an angel or a. An, yeah. Is it an angel or well, a Nephilim? So, or? Yes, there are spoilers. Spoilers ahead. Spoiler number one. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> uh, so, so it's more or less a vision of, of Baphomet, um, and that's a little bit in season one and plays into even season two. Mm. So. so going back to the basic premise of the show, though, what I love in the beginning was when she was approached by... Uh, what's Leland? His? No, not Leland. Uh, the priest. Priest. Yep. And that's David Acosta. David Acosta, all right. She was baffled, and, and I think most people who were watching her show were probably just as baffled as she was that the church would even approach the secular world to investigate. Mm -hmm. And I find that I've always found that in the Catholics' favor that because the church itself 
is very skeptical of miracles. Yeah, they're not just going to say any miracle is a miracle or any demon possession is a possession. They will actually go through great lengths to say it isn't Mm -hmm. until everything has kind of been ruled out. And then they will say, okay, we, we need to really consider this as demonic or something spiritual. And so I love that interplay that happens between that. And I think she was really kind of dumbfounded in, in the beginning by that. So, And so our listeners understand that is a real possession, or a real possession, a real position, <laughs> not possession. We're not covering that yet uh, in the Catholic Church. So it is, an assessor is a real position. Mm-hmm. And they do send them out to assess miracles, possessions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Uh, they do mention it in the show. I just can't remember what the Latin term of it is, but the section that of science mm-hmm. within the Catholic Church. And it's like, yes, I'll say it time and time again, science does not discount God, it explains God. Yeah, mm. yeah. The overlap. Yes. That's and, where our worlds meet. Yeah. I love that line. Yeah. <laughs> and assessors are real church workers people like priests in training or actual priests or retired priests um i believe and i could be wrong i believe that also some deacons are assessors as well um but they go out and they will hire um real legitimate skeptics to find out if things kind of like in the show are real or not um and they do this even I mentioned Marian apparitions. So, for example, at Lourdes, if you were to go to Lourdes, um, series of miracles. Anybody who's familiar with familiar with Lourdes, we covered that back in our first Marian apparitions episode with my priest. Actually, um, if you go back and listen to that, you'll you'll hear the whole background of of that miraculous encounter. Um, in that instance, the Pope of that time period, I believe it was Pius X. Um, he wanted to make sure these miracles were legitimate. And so what he did was he hired actual um, medical practitioners in the university to set up a hospital by Lourdes to verify before and after. To this day in Lourdes, that hospital still exists and makes all medical records available to any medical practitioners or scientists around the world. Mm-hmm. So Because they want to make sure they're legitimate. Mm-hmm. In fact, our own government set investigators to lords to that hospital they investigated 54 miracles and found that they were legitimate and there's no reason to not trust our government (laughs) (laughs) well in this instance in this instance they wanted to disprove these events because the government hates religion right Mm -hmm. i mean uh, is skeptical of religion (laughs) and so and so no no let's be honest here the government wants to be religion. <laughs> Touche. Future podcast episode right there. No <laughs> and so they they did send investigators over. And it was very, very strict criteria. So they had to make sure the miracles happened on site, were lasting throughout the person's life, and they could verify that they were going in fully inflicted. So though they had a very, very, quite, very, very tight criteria, because there are miracles of people who take the water from Lords and go back, and there's miracles that happen with people who consume the water off premise. They eliminated all of those. Okay. So and they only investigated fifty four of them, and they found all fifty four to be, quote unquote, actual phenomena. <laughs> so. Interesting. And again, that's in the Catholic church's favor and the skeptic would say that phenomena just hasn't been explained yet and that's how they they go about it they don't know they they if you read the report they say we can't explain why it happened it happened perhaps it was miracles that take place because of mental um anyway (laughs) they lay out a bunch of things that could potentially be but it comes down to the fact they could not explain the phenomena so who's the guy in evil um, who does all the scientific work, all the... Ben. Ah, yes. Yeah. That's Asif Manvi. Mm-hmm. He plays uh, Ben Shakir. He's a contractor who works with David as his technical expert and equipment handler. He plays devil's advocate, providing scientific explanations for supernatural phenomena. Nice little pun there. But a bum. 
And he's a he's a fun character. Many people find him to be their favorite character because not only is he the tech guy on site who does all the technical explanations, but the guy has so many quips. It's hilarious. He is funny. Yeah. And he is the lapsed Muslim on the show as well. Yes, he is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I the show treats it very well, both lapsed Catholics and lapsed Muslim, Muslims in that way, mm-hmm. and they, it plays very sympathetically to both of them. Mm-hmm. So, um, it and it does a good job showing the bad side of some of those too, but but it it's very fair in their analysis. And so so far, I've seen both seasons. We're gonna only talk about talking about season one, but so far both seasons have done a good job showing a balanced approach to people of faith so. let's see we've got buddhism mm-hmm. we've got catholicism of course yep. uh islam muslim uh were there, were there any other religions shown in the show I'm trying to remember um christianity in there didn't they? i don't i don't bum. <laughs> all right that's my jab technically catholicism <laughs> is christianity in fact it's the original form anyway <laughs> <laughs> There you go. <laughs> but uh, um, they they do cover um, a little bit of um, of Protestantism because there is a Protestant minister who's trying to get David to leave Catholicism. Oh, they also show um, yes. they also show paganism, and um, I can't remember if this is season two or not, but. Um, David's father. That episode. Oh, that is season one. Yes, yeah, that um, is season one. I, yes. I can't remember what religion it was, but it was Africana. Yeah, um, yeah. It was. It was almost like a mix between African and uh, and maybe a little bit of modern um, New Ageism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was thinking very New Orleans sort of. Oh, that's another one that they showed. Yeah, voodooish. Yes, voodoo. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, they did. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yep. So definitely showing a lot of religion, a lot of religious aspects in the yeah. show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was it was a lot of fun. Um, right from the opener, it's kind of it's kind of interesting because she's trying to, as a psychologist, assess uh, a uh, a serial killer that she believes is trying to fake an illness. Ah, uh, the religion of science and psychology. Yeah. Yeah, so that that was a very fun, interesting episode. Um, let's see. Well, because Chris- there is a lot of overlap. Absolutely, there is. So, I mean, you you can definitely see it from her side and, yeah. and be sympathetic, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, and, and as as you were saying, as David says, there is a crossover right there between psychology and religion, and that's where they have to find their common ground to find out which one it is. Yeah. yeah. And and what causes what. I mean, are they psychosis because of a demon, or are they? Do they have a demon because of their psychosis, yeah. or is it both? Or is it both? Yeah. <laughs> the chicken and egg. What's causing what? Yeah. What's the symptom? What's the disease? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right inside. Uh, it's it's some of the naming of the episodes are interesting too. Like if we go to to number one, it says Genesis one. <laughs> <laughs> Heard of that. Yeah, and that's where uh, Dr. Kristen Bouchard, a psychologist primarily employed by the Queen's DA's office, learns that the defendant in her latest trial, Orson LaRoe, is claiming to be demonically possessed in order to claim an insanity plea. So it, it, he plays a very good role. Like, he plays that role so well. Mm-hmm. Like, at one point, like, his eyes roll back and he starts speaking in Latin and yeah, <laughs> like, and and that just brings me to the point of how far are you willing to go to stay out of jail? Like, it's it's one thing to say, "Hey, I'm going to plead insanity and do all these foolish and silly things." Mm-hmm. It's another thing to fully commit to that. I mean, in in the show, he takes those notes that were stolen, uh, the therapy notes of Christian Bouchard. And he uses that against her. Absolutely. And so it's like, how much, how far are you able to commit in order to plea insanity? Yeah. And Ed, do you have any comments on um, today's world? How that, 
how people plea insanity or anything like that? Uh, no, not really. I mean, it's just um, it just go, it goes back to the you know the science and stuff of it. Um, you know, people, you know, is what is is there truly a mental issue there? You know, is there something that you know causes person or um, to do what they did? And that would be outside of the normal parameters of what we would consider of, of being the normal um, thinking process and motivation process of human reasoning and thinking and actions. Or were they fully capable in the right mind and just, you know, yeah. did, did the unthinkable? Yeah. It, it takes me back to when I was in kin- kindergarten and it was the silliest thing in the world, but I was just goofing off, talking during class, and the teacher just yelled at me and said, Sam, go out in the hallway. You're not going to be disrupting class. Well, I go out in the hallway, and my mom works at the school at that time. So she is walking down the hallway. She asks me, Sam, what are you doing in the hallway? I'm bawling my eyes out. I'm like, what? For, I don't know what age you are in kindergarten, but I'm bawling my eyes out saying, the devil made me do it. <laughs> She takes me in. She says, hey, talks to the teacher. I go back to class, promise to behave. Within five minutes, I'm back outside because I'm goofing off. But that's besides the point. But it leads me to the how much can we actually blame the devil for our evil deeds? Yeah. Because the whole purpose of humanity is we have the choice to do evil we or, do. To do, or to do right. And that is what creates humanity. That is what allows us to go to either heaven or hell based on our actions, based on our, our soul. Yeah. So how much can we actually say the devil made me do it versus are, are we actually, do we actually have a demon inside us or are we just listening to a demon or are we just choosing to be demonic? Mm. Yeah. And I think she realized during that interview or maybe the second time she interviewed, I can't remember. Time. Was it the second time mm-hmm. when he started? Um... Right after he strangled her. Well, yeah. <laughs> but no, he said some things spoiler. before that point. Um, yeah, another spoiler. Where he knew that she was having a visitor from the night terrors, didn't he? Yeah. Oh, George. That's when George starts appearing, yeah. And she was like, all right, something is different here. It's off. It's not my normal protocol that I can just kind of fall back on now. Yeah. And and that's where those stolen uh, therapy notes comes in play of how does he know this? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What's really interesting, though, is that George seems in ongoing episodes to maybe not just be something that she's imagined. Yeah. So explain who George is real quick. So George is the demon, the night terror that starts appearing in her dreams. She becomes frozen, you know, and can't move. Sleep paralysis. Mm-hmm. And she cannot move. Uh, and he starts making nuanced threats towards her. Um, you could do the you know. Go ahead. Hello, Kristen. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, he, he's he's really kind of a creepy, interesting character that you just do, would not want to meet in the middle of the night. Mm-mm. Or um, in the afternoon. <laughs> now the actor who plays him, now he has the highest pitch voice, and it was hilarious. Was that great? <laughs> really? Oh yeah, didn't yeah. you must not have seen that? Um, Christian was showing her children the actor. Oh, I remember yes. later in the episode. <laughs> yep. But yeah, this, this show is I think came out in 2019. I think. Yeah. So you've had time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, season three should be coming out in August. Yeah. Yeah. Anxiously looking forward to it. And there are some distinctive differences between season one and season two. So season two is more, it, it feels more like a Scooby-Doo episodes. Yeah. Not only that, but it's more, it's more graphic. It's more intense. Mm-hmm. There's more language. There's more, the, the storylines get more in depth. So that's why I wanted to cover them separately because right. season one is a little more network friendly. Right. So, so y'all have until next episode that we cover this to watch up to season two. That's right. <laughs> what I like about the priest, though, uh, David Acosta, yeah, is that he, it, aside from just being part of the Catholic Church, I think a lot of people can relate to him in the searching, yeah, and the wanting mushrooms. to find meaning, you know, behind 
just the ordinary mundane type of things, you, you get that sense about him and I can really relate to that. Yeah. Not only that, but you his, have to be Catholic to his search for God. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he, he uses mushrooms. He uses psychedelics to try and find God. Yeah. He goes for runs. He prays all the time. And just like every normal person, maybe not every normal person, but every person that I feel like, doesn't really hear God mm-hmm. until they hear God. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny because he even references that. And he says that he had the first vision mm-hmm. and that ever since then, he's been trying to reach back out to get another vision. Mm-hmm. But hence using, you know, the mushrooms and stuff like that. It's like, uh, I mushroom. can't remember the Bible verse, but you cannot eat from heaven. Otherwise everything that you would eat would tastes like dust or something like that i can't remember what it is but it's like he he got that taste of god yeah and now everything else just seems like dust yeah 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 Yeah, that's interesting and that happens um in fact a lot of priests and bishops will tell you that they experienced something which then pushed them into that direction even my priest my priest uh he said uh i'll let him tell his own story but he had uh, he heard the voice of God and had his own Marian experience, um, which is why he's a priest. Um, so it's 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 interesting that you, God will push you in a direction, but then it seems like you're tempered them throughout your life. You know, maybe that's what makes us saints, right? The fact that we do push through to find out who we really are. So, but yeah, so. Th- just chock full episode one just chock full takes you through all of the characters and um they're a little bit in their backgrounds and it's it's very interesting which then kind of takes you into episode two um just real briefly a girl named clark is miraculously revived seconds after her autopsy begins and david's team is assigned to determine if there was any divine intervention A review of security camera footage appears to show the image of a woman who died an hour before Naomi, which Ben suggested could be the result of digital manipulation. The DA offers to reinstate Kristen on a two-year contract, which David agrees to match. However, when she goes to tell the DA, he informs her the offer has been rescinded and that her Dr. Townsend has been replaced in her stead. So, let's talk about Dr. Townsend. Anybody? <laughs> Dr. Townsend. Refresh my memory. So, uh, it's played by Michael Emerson. So, Dr. Neeland, or Leland Townsend is oh, Kristen's Leland. professional rival and an expert in the occult. He is obsessed with encouraging others to commit evil acts. He has a particular interest in David stemming from his contempt for those who believe themselves incapable of sin. If if Leland is not your favorite in the in the series, there's a part of you that's lying. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so for those who don't if you're if his name doesn't ring a bell, he got his big start in a Lost and he was an awesome character in the show Lost. Um and he's played weird odd characters ever since. He's always a weird character, and he always plays like one of the best characters in any show that he's in. <laughs> yeah, I will say this. He was definitely much better in season one than season two, in my opinion. Okay. But he he did a phenomenal job being the being the bad guy. Yeah. Um I can't remember if this was season one or season two, so I'm not gonna say what his actual name was. Okay. Now, I think that's actually season two. Okay, that you're talking yeah, about. And I'm yeah. very he glad I'm not turned into that. a wuss in season two. I'm not sure what happened. I think he's, uh, we'll, we'll touch in season two <laughs> in season two because I think that he's sleeping on purpose in season two. And we'll cover that later because there's some awesome things that happen in season two. But uh, which really makes you wonder what's happening. Mm-hmm. But we'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, in season one, he's a manipulative mastermind. Yeah. I mean, and we'll talk about an episode in a little bit because which is a really cool episode. Um, in season one, you could tell that uh, David Acosta and him have a history yeah. because he, he ends up instigating 
uh, Acosta is actually hitting him in the court in the, in the court uh, setting. I remember that. Yeah. yeah, and we'll understand why in season two. <laughs> but um, dun dun dun. Oh, speaking of which, we're going to take a break for our sponsors. Have you ever wanted to train Muay Thai? Perhaps there's no gyms near you. Perhaps you work odd hours. Perhaps, like a few of us, you don't like germs. Whichever way it goes, you can train online with some of the best instructors from around the country, either live or in class with other students. Living Muay Thai gives you the chance to do all of this and much more. So jump into live classes and on demand right now. LivingMuayThai.com Hey, it's Gumby here from Bible Over Brews. Are you looking to get some editing done in your podcast? Maybe you don't have the hours or time it takes to edit your content, but you still need to get it done. Maybe you need a customized track or a song for your podcast or your next project without having to worry about copyright issues. Well, look no further than SoulWorkMusic.com, where this footwork is done for you. I'll get that editing post-production work done right for you or create you that customized song that fits your project or podcast to help support your life's work. If this sounds like what you need, reach out to me at SoulWorkMusic.com. Again, at SoulWorkMusic.com. And remember, there's nothing taboo over brew. Another, another uh, spoiler. I love the fact that she had to trick him and record him. Mm-hmm. I have a deep fake. Yeah. And he was, he, <laughs> he was impressed by it. He, like, he was. Oh. Well, I think it was more a impressed of, all right, you're diving deeper into lying. You are corrupting yourself. Yeah. You had the gall. You had the balls. Yeah. To actually corrupt yourself and do something bad. She's playing the game. In order to win. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She's playing the game. Is I don't know whose game at this point, but yeah. So Ed, because you haven't seen the show yet. Yeah, that's sorry about shame, that. Shame. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I tried earlier today and uh, I just couldn't get my subscription to go through, but I'm working on it. Well, the episodes are an hour each, so brace yourself. And yeah, that's a normal TV show for me, so Amen to that. But she um in order to help a client out in court who was going to be sent to prison, uh, she made a recording of her and Leland uh, outside the courtroom, and he was talking about how evil and manipulative and the reason that he was lying in court to destroy this uh, African-American teenager to send him to prison. And I think he said after, am I allowed to say this on Twitch? Yeah, go ahead. After the second rape, he'll become a man. And it was just about the corrupting of youth. And that's why he was being so evil towards this uh, defendant. Mm -hmm. Well, she recorded it all. And I know this is all. I'm sorry, viewers. I hope that you've already watched this. (laughs) She recorded it all. And his voice was complete static. And hers came out clearly. So in order to make sure that the defendant actually got the defense he needed. She deep faked his voice from what she could remember in order to save the defendant who I can't remember if he was not guilty or if he was, I can't. Yeah. Yeah. He was not guilty. Yeah. Uh, and it was actually Ben. Cause he's the tech genius who was able to make her help her make the deep fake. Yeah. Well, it, it, it just shows the, the willingness to self corrupt for better means. Yeah. yeah. And there is some of that in the Bible. I mean, there's times in the Bible when God actually tells people to mislead people. Uh-oh. It's, whoa, whoa. <laughs> it's, it's interesting, but it's there. Um, in fact, if you go to uh, the book of Kings, uh, there's a divine council scene where it says uh, Micaiah is uh, sitting down. Kazutek. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, and it says that uh, he calls his divine council together to ask them who has ideas on how to stop the king doing from what he's doing. It's, <coughs> it says one spirit says this, one spirit says that. And it says, finally, a spirit stepped up and said, I will be a lying spirit in the mouths of all of his prophets. And then God says, go forth, you shall be successful. So right there, he gives his blessing. Now, mind you, he's talking about his, his pagan prophets, right? Mm-hmm. Um, heathen prophets, whatever, mm-hmm. however you want to say it. But, he gives his blessing 
to that spirit to create this this misinformation across his own prophets. And that's God giving his consent. So I think my favorite part of lying in the Bible was um I can't remember what story this was, but they were supposed to light torches and just have like a ring around Gideon. Yes. And it was just like, oh, wow. All right. So we're lying about how many forces we have to make them <laughs> feel like they're surrounded. Like we got this massive army and we don't. That was my best instance of lying. <laughs> so there there are instances in the Bible of God using misinformation to actually help people. In fact, uh, if you remember, Rahab, the prostitute, uh, lies to the to the people to in order to defend um certain people that went out to uh, find out if Jericho was or was not able to be taken down. That's right, U.S. government. (laughs) Bible condones misinformation. You are welcome. (laughs) Only for good purposes. Oh, well, yeah, you're screwed. (laughs) (laughs) So, so that is, so what she did was not unprecedented in the, uh, in the eyes of, of scripture. So, there were shenanigans, we know. <laughs> but it does it does bring in question, do the ends justify the means? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a question that's been asked throughout history of humanity, you know, for years and years and years, especially when, you know, in stories and stuff like that. I mean, you have this awesome Batman poster over here. And if, <laughs> if, if, if anybody who can't see it, it's the Batman and the Joker um, from Dark Knight. And, you know, the Joker's whole premise, or one of his main premises against Batman, was trying to push Batman to the point to do, to break the run rule he doesn't kill. Yep. His whole thing was, I want to push Batman to this point. Like, how far will you go to stop me? And I just want to say about Batman, he will maim, he will bruise, he will break bones, he will destroy lives, but he won't kill. I mean, how many times has he thrown people <laughs> off ledges? How many times has he just annihilated an entire team of henchmen? And their henchmen, they never counted those uh, stories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you don't want me to dive deep into this one. <laughs> All right, sorry. Wrong show. I'm more worried about Oh, no, no. Taxes. That's what I'm more worried about. The reason why you don't want me to dive deep into this one is because Batman's actually directly been responsible for a lot of death. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe you don't shoot somebody in the chest, but if you're standing next to them and willing to watch them die, is there a difference? <laughs> I'm sure a bad ring to the chest is just as bad. <laughs> so I'm just saying, just because you didn't directly cause something doesn't mean you didn't inadvertently still kill them. All that being said, Batman is now in theaters. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we do the reviews on this one too. Yeah. Um, so on this episode, what's really interesting is they, at first they think that she's divinely resurrected. Right, and the priest believes that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then it actually, you find out it's it's actually subtle racism that caused it because they did not go through all of her resuscitations that they normally would do on her if she wasn't dark skin. So I felt like that was a bit of a reach for that episode. Yes and no. There. So just so you know, that actually came out of some lawsuits that showed the same thing. Mm-hmm. So they actually came out of real lawsuits. Oh, yeah. They did their research. They did their research on it. And uh and that that that's a real thing. So this was based on that research, that specific part? Yeah. Yeah. So it turns out that there's a series of lawsuits that are pending out there right now where they did not perform the amount the right amount of resuscitations for uh minority people, and in some cases women, um, as opposed to they as they did uh, for white men. So then those Google them, those lawsuits are out there. They're real lawsuits. <laughs> interesting. I yeah, guess just for that. So it just, it seemed like a leap, but I I can understand where they came from. It yeah. just seemed like a leap from where they were collecting evidence about it to where, how they jumped to, Oh yeah, it's racism. Yeah. It just felt like uh Hollywood uh, yeah. leftism. Yeah, uh, hopping uh, bandwagon type thing. Yeah, I wouldn't go yeah. that far. I, they, they're they are exposing a real problem. Yeah, it is yes, a real absolutely. problem. Again, I so, haven't seen this, but it sounds like they just didn't set it up in the correct way to 
get you from point A to point B. It's kind of what it sounds like. They do cover a lot of ground in between. And one of the cool things that they take away is there is a mystery in there they never solve. Oh. Yes. So, because they do actually catch what they believe is a spirit on video, and Ben yeah. confirms the video was not tampered with. So, it does set up... Ben confirms that he could not explain said video. Yeah, and that it was not tampered with. <laughs> So that was actually really interesting. So, and, and in fact, that goes into following, that goes into following episodes, by the way. Um, because I believe it's uh, the next one that we'll cover in a second. Because what we're going to do is talk about our next drink. Because we only sampled the mead. So now we're going to be going into Sincere Winery. And mind you, I am probably butchering the name. I believe it's a French name. It's probably Sincere. Uh, but the, uh, or however you pronounce this, S I N C E R R E winery. So it's actually a very well recognized winery. Uh, it's their white wine. So the appearance, it says it's the pale, strong yellow. The nose can be highly perfumed, especially around Chavanois, orange, grapefruit, and lemon scented with hints of acacia flower and mint varies with soil type flavors are orange and orange flower hints black uh, black currant mint honey and spices depending on the vine location mm. the gravel limestone soils produce the most elegant and light wines highly mineral on flint while clay limestone wines take longer to develop it is an abv of 14.1 so there is a huge article on this winery that i will uh post inside of the notes for this episode uh by the way um we have Finally, at some point, uh, our uh, our newsletter coming out and you'll have access on the newsletter to a secure folder because there's some things that we can't really post publicly. Or so, we have to kill you. Yeah, so some things will be inside of the study folders. That's coming. We're working on it now um, where you can go in and you can dive into some of the show notes and you'll have access to the various PowerPoints. And as we release these episodes, several are already up. And we, as we release the episodes, the PowerPoint are embedded in the videos as well. Mm. So, so here we go. We're going Work to that, start <laughs> pouring this wine. And again, I'm this point, I thought we had more uh, mead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I only grabbed Jeez. one. I was really getting into that by the end of it. You know, that's what you were oh, it for. It carried over so well. It carried over so well. So. But, I'm afraid that, that I only had the one. If you're on video, you could see the bottle. We only had this one small bottle of mead. I I brought it in as a taster. Um, they are not the cheapest, but they are phenomenal. Again, if you live in Ohio, uh, go over to uh, Forest City Meadery. It's uh, fantastic. It's a very very good place. Now this wine, which is a white wine. Ooh, so grape on the top. There's a nice, beautiful, flory grape fragrance right oh. at the top of it. Orange, grapefruit. Mm. It does have a very, very slight minty overtone, but it's 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 slight. Orange, grapefruit, lemon scented with hints of acacia flower and mints. I do catch a little bit of lemon. Yeah. Lemon, is, not, lemon is what I was hitting most. Yeah. It's not overpowering though. It's it's subtle. No, it's it's very distinct. Grapefruit and lemon was, yeah. Ooh, cheers, cheers, cheers. Salud, salud. It's really good. It's um, it's well balanced. Now, on the taste side of it, I do taste a little bit of the mint. Oh. I'm a back end. Hmm. Yeah. I'm definitely yeah, more in the back end. A little bit of uh I'm catching more of the lemon on the front side. Mm -hmm. And that backwash not backwash, but the uh <laughs> <laughs> wrong word. <laughs> Leave that one out. No, I'm just kidding. Um the like I mean I'm getting a lot of like that clay back ends just yeah tone undertone whatever you, i don't know the actual words for all this but yeah it, it's definitely there it's not bold but it's not in the background it's mm -hmm. it's somewhere 
Yeah, it, and it's ever present. It, it it definitely has that. There, there's a slight pungence to it, but that's definitely the mm-hmm. black current. It has that black current, you know, nuance. I would yeah. say. I wouldn't even say it's it's a full flavor. It's a nuance. Um, it's nice. It's very well balanced. It's not up in your face. Yeah, Spe- I like it. Yeah, would be good with fish. <laughs> fish or a ling- linguine? Oh, I could see this with a beautiful linguine. And I, I'm not even a. I'm not really much of an Alfred, Alfred, Alfredo guy, but I could see this with an Alfredo. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is beautiful. Light, floral. And I think what kind of sets us apart a little bit is that very slight current pungence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's really nice. Two for Good. two. Yeah. Good job. Sincere, sincere. Uh, <laughs> However you pronounce that. Good job. Sam, what's your what's your favorite wine? Oh, I don't have a favorite wine. Um usually it's some type of blackberry wine. Ooh, those are good. But when it comes to like brand, when it comes to age, just give me a, a good deep red wine, a fruity red wine, that's top notch for me. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So is it are you going more like a uh, more like a red delicious or maybe a sangria, maybe a Shiraz? Yeah, um, sangria is definitely my my go to for an everyday wine. I usually have I don't know two cups of sangria a day. Okay, okay, but a Sauvignon or a, um, yeah, that's about it. I like a Sauvignon. That's, all, that's about all I drink. <laughs> okay, I like a Sauvignon. Or even a good pino. It's yeah. Uh, pino is usually a white wine, yep. and I usually drink red. But okay, um, yeah, okay, yeah. Do you like the the Shiraz at all? Mm-hmm. So and it's I I really find that the I feel like I need subtitles, Ed. <laughs> you and me both. If we're talking whiskeys here, I can join right. in. <laughs> we do those episodes. There you go. Most of those. So so just just so the audience understands, we're kind of gonna be parsing this a little bit because we want to cover all three kinds of drinks. So. We've got the idea branching forward that reviews will cover more of the wines and mixed drink side of things. And then over on the Bible of a Bruce proper, we'll cover more of the beer side of things. And then over on the new side, the deeper mixed drinks and liquors. Where you need the deeper so, drinks and yeah. liquors. For, for news, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> we talk in politics, you need bourbon. Uh, right? Yeah. Good bourbon, heavy scotch. There you go. In fact, I, I Jameson Gold. We'll talk later because I there's a couple peated, uh, both scotches and there's a good peated bourbon I've gotten into. Oh, so good. Anyway, we'll go into that later on news. So, <laughs> but uh, I like Coco Bond myself. Have you had Coco Bond the wine? No, I don't think so. Uh, they make a great red wine, Sam. Coco okay. Bond. I, I, so what episode are we on? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're on. Evil. <laughs> we're on reviews. That's right. Yeah. And I, I want to cover some Aussie Shiraz later, too, because I really, the Aussie Shiraz are just, they're such a beautiful, deep portfolio of flavors. I want to, yeah, I, I love good Aussie Shiraz. So, all right, back to evil. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next episode after that, we're not going to cover every episode. We're going to just highlight some of the cool key ones, right? Um, and some of the earlier ones are some of the key ones because you're building the characters out. Yeah. Um, and the one, the next one was, was three stars. And that's where, uh, Kristen learns that Townsend intervened in an old case, reversing her expert opinion. David is asked to assess the case of Byron Duke, who is a legendary Broadway producer who sold his soul to a demon named Joe in return for a promise that he would win. A Tony Award. Ben and Kristen insist that, quote-unquote, Joe is part of a prank being pulled on Duke by hacking his virtual assistant. However, despite Ben's attempt to track the hack, Joe manages to enter his house and take control of his father's virtual assistant, taunting his sister until he destroys the device. With Duke beginning to suffer a complete mental breakdown, David locates the disgruntled IT tech who originated the prank. (laughs) He swears he had nothing to do with hacking Ben's home. Duke 
Duke subsequently commits suicide after he receives a mysterious email telling him hell is only half full. Christian uses a deep fake. This is the one you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Or Townsend. So this was a very interesting uh, uh, episode because it has so many of those nuanced things that are building these characters up. Yeah. So John Glover is one of my all-time favorite actors. Okay. Uh, he was in one of my favorite shows called uh, Smallville. That show uh, was pretty much what I grew up on. I loved Smallville. It, it was fantastic, except for last few seasons. But <laughs> mixed, maybe mixed stuff on the last couple seasons. But yeah. Anyways, it also uh, introduced. We're, we're on evil, not Smallville. It also introduced but... Green Arrow, one of my favorite characters. <laughs> but uh, well, it introduced it to mainstream audiences. Yeah. I had known about Green Arrow since I was a small child in the 70s. But anyway. <laughs> it's neither here nor there. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was a very, very good episode because it got to see how, how, see how deep people dive into the tech side of things to find out if somebody's being influenced artificially. Mm-hmm. So that was a really fun episode, especially for Ben. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. In fact, they even uh, subtly hint in his uh, Islamic background in that one as well. I remember that with his sister. Yeah. 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 So that was a cool one. Not only not only to build up some of the stuff from uh, Kristen, you know, the lying, the deep fakes, but also Ben, it kind of builds his character out. Finding out Because up to that point, you're kind of questioning what his background is. And this one kind of fills his background out a little bit. And you find out that he is the lapsed Muslim, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So. Is that the one where she kind of went, Kristen, went MIA for a bit, went into the bathroom and started having like. No, 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 no. That's season two. That's season two? Yeah. Oh, okay. that, yeah. That's the episode I finished yeah. up on today. Yeah. You're oh. thinking of season two. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to say. Darn wine. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I I did love this episode, not just because John Glover was in it, but because it did show the... Which character was he in it, though? He he was Byron. He was, he was the... The uh, producer. The producer, the guy that was yelling at all, all his assistants. He went through what? What was it? 57 assistants? Yeah. Within one year, that's... Let's just say, he's a complete jerk. Yeah. Hollywood incarnate. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, he did play that part well. Yeah. He, like phenomenal actor. Yeah. Like like if you wanted to picture the perfect <clears throat> quote unquote a whole producer. Yeah. That was him. <laughs> but I I I love that episode because it showed not only the evil of technology or what technology can be used for. Could be used for, yes. But also the um we're always watching you be on your best behavior sort of mentality that after his demon was exercised from his technology, Mm -hmm. he felt like there was no escape that he had to commit suicide. Like he was being extremely nice to his uh, employees afterwards. Yeah. He was saying, no, that's okay. That it's all good. I love you sort of mentality. And then just jumped because he knew. Oh, like you said, y'all had three years by now. (laughs) Slackers. But he he felt like there was no escape. Yeah, and I think that again that resonates with a lot of people. That well, I've committed all these sins. Yeah, I've done evil things. I've had evil done to me. There's nothing for me here. I, I'm I'm done. I'm yeah. I am no longer safe. I will never be safe. Mm. I am not able to be um <sighs> saved. Yeah. There's a different word I'm thinking of that I just can't think of. Yeah. But redeemed. Yes, that's yeah. the word. Thank you. He is unredeemed. Ir- irredeemable. Yeah. That word. And it's <laughs> it, it's funny because it does play very well on that whole Hollywood stigma, you know, the quote unquote casting couch mentality of where people have to sell their souls, sell their body, sell their mind in order to be successful. 
that episode played very well on just showing you how materialistic that world really can be. Yeah, no, I agree. And then when everything is stripped away, once everything, you know, including the demon and all of that stuff was exposed for what it was and everything was stripped away, like his identity was, there was nothing. There's nothing left. And so he was, he, he felt empty. He was completely described. He completely described himself by, I need that Tony. Yeah. 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 A completely materialistic, a completely empty, meaningless drive to live. Yep. Absolutely. So, so why not episode? Just jump off a building? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, when you're devoid of meaning, I know. What else is there to live for? Yeah. No, I know. Well, the, the very next episode, again, a couple of these foundational episodes are the are the first several because they really build out the premise of what the show is all about. And uh, the very next episode is that one that covers the quote unquote possession, right? Yes. Yeah. Where there's uh, so Kristen and Dr. Boggs are forced to weigh in on the church decision to perform an exorcism on Carolina Hopkins, a woman demonstrating signs of schizophrenia, but also elements associated with demonic possession. Their concerns that Caroline is being tortured and deprived of medical care conflict with the fears of the priests that she will succumb to evil unless the exorcism is properly finished and both sides argue over what to do so I, i'm not going to read the whole thing because this opens up some really good discussion here yeah. <laughs> so, and wasn't the husband caught in the middle wasn't he there very much so and honestly the husband was very very balanced in his approach he wasn't demonizing either side he he just i just want my wife well yeah, yeah. i don't care who has the answers okay, this is the african-american uh mm-hmm. woman yes. that was possessed yes. the, okay yeah. so it's a very well done episode yeah very well done episode and it, it plays heavily on both sides because first off she is acting like she's possessed but schizophrenia can look like possession. Mm -hmm. So you could see both sides of the argument, right? One, a couple key takeaways. So on on the psychologist side, Kristen and the doctor swap out the holy water and use tap. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Dump it out, put tap water in there, and she still responds to it. So they're like, look, not demons, right? (laughs) But... Then she turns around during this same uh, exorcism, looks at David and tells him what his vision was. Well, at least part of it. She hints at, at key terms of his first vision with God that he's told nobody. There's no way she can know this. And yet she says key parts of his vision that absolutely nobody can know. So somehow she has that knowledge so there's a little bit of back and forth here right is it schizophrenia does she have divine knowledge what's going on right so so it's a, it's a one of those key episodes that shows you both sides of this argument so very well yeah he was convinced it was definitely demonic possession yeah and, and the psychologists just the opposite they were convinced because she switched the water and she still responded so that therefore prove your conclusion you know yeah i just love the priest's explanation for why the holy water <laughs> works still i do too well because i'm the i'm the conduit for what the holy water means the holy water is just you know a, a halfway point well it's it, because god wants that holy water to be the medium and yeah it's like, oh, yes. it, in his defense he's not wrong god can choose to use a priest as a conduit in any fashion so it in one sense, he's not wrong because holy water is only one step of exorcism, right? I agree with you. Yeah. I just think they portrayed it. They could have portrayed that better. By they it could have. Absolutely. They, they made have. him look like kind of like a schmuck in that movie. They did. They <laughs> totally did. And well, in, in that episode, to his credit, he plays that priest very well. I mean, mm-hmm. you could tell the priest is well-intentioned. He's well-meaning. He's doing what he thinks is right. So... Unlike a, a lot of shows that immediately show the priest as some kind of evil charlatan who is just out for either sex or money, um, you, the, the priest is very well intentioned. 
So, yeah. So in in kind of in the end, uh, the husband wanted all of them in the room to continue the exorcism. Okay. Like the medical side and the the church side. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. I, I I did like how they portrayed all all the priests in this show. It it, it wasn't Spanish Inquisition. Right. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't you know the what people view Catholic Church as nowadays with the whole church voice, yeah, you know, stigma, yeah. But it was completely real. It was completely just humanizing priests, yeah. And I liked that. On an upcoming episode on our other podcast, Bible of a Bruise. This is Bible of a Bruise reviews. On Bible of a Bruise, we will be covering the Inquisition. Because the Inquisition is not quite what people think it was. Hmm. And if I get the historian I want, it goes deep. So you usually get what you want, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a question about the exorcism and the priest who, who does it. Um, right. Do they really have like that kind of pouch thing with all their tools in it? And yes. The, the answer is yes. Okay. There are exorcism kits. In fact, the one. Most of them are probably not legit. Pretty but, convinced but, about some of my kids. <laughs> <laughs> but if wow. you <laughs> if you go online, you can find exorcist kits. No way. Some of them claim to be historical from priests that were exorcists. I really am skeptical of that. I'm pretty sure the the church has possession of almost all of them. Sounds a little evangelical, <laughs> but I but they it's going for the science side. <laughs> <laughs> but they do have them because there are blessed crucifixes that are used, right? And mind you, yeah, in fact, here for anybody who wants to see them, all right, there are certain crosses that are used in exorcism, mm-hmm. all right. I actually. There you go. I actually wear one. So this one right here is a Benedictine cross. Uh, the Benedictine cross. There you go. Right there. There you go. And the Benedictine cross actually has a, the Latin prayer embedded in it for exorcism. Feels like supernatural just having so that tattooed on your chest right there. <laughs> um, no demon can possess me. <laughs> no, that doesn't, does not mean they can't. Uh, but there is the, the full prayer. In, the, in Latin, it's... Uh, uh sacra semihi lux non draco semihi lux vaderatro satana uh sunt mala quelibus no nun quam ah not a real catholic if i latin phrase well because i'm trying not to sing it it's uh overly catholic crux sacra semihi lux non draco semihi lux dux vaderatro vaderatro satana Sunt mala quelibus Nom quam sued, uh, sun malaquelli boss, epse pene van pin. Ah, anyway. Catholic Church be like, that's trademarked. <laughs> it's, uh, that's it, over 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a full, it's a full prayer written in Sounds the like Benedictine order. It's a Anthony song, man. It's, it's a, it's a cool, I know I can get this. It's a crux, crux sacra simi lux, non draco simi lux, vade retro satana. Nom quam suare mehivana, sum mala quelibos, epse vana nabibos. That's it. Nice. <laughs> so like it. that's the Latin Benedictine Prayer of Exorcism. That's actually written on the cross. And um, priests will often have the, uh, the Benedictine cross as they're performing an exorcism. Okay. So, um, yes, please. Uh, and so... There are a series of different. There's there's holy water, the Benedictine cross, um, uh, holy oils, and there's a whole series of different things that they will use in exorcism. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, yeah, so it's pretty cool. Um, now that being said, in the next, I think it's the very next episode, she ends up suing the church, claiming that she was never actually possessed. The lady from the previous episode. Yes. Ah. And that's in, the, I believe it's the very next episode, where the priest actually lets them know that she's suing them. I don't remember that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, is <laughs> that was hilarious. Cool. Oh, yeah, yeah, you've been served. Yeah. I don't know why but, you've been served, but you've been served. Yes. <laughs> but then how did they know? How did she know the visions and stuff? So, so again, there's a lot of back and forth on that. W- was that more because of the husband's point of view? or? Um. 
No, I think they're just it's one of those money grabs because they they don't really follow follow up with the story, which kind of tells you that they're after the money. Well, not only that, but when you don't truly believe yourself, yeah, and you only see things from a scientific point of view, you don't fully understand the religious point of view and what the Catholic priests were doing. Right. You don't understand why they were doing it, how they were doing it, and why it was necessary for the reason that they were doing it. Yeah, absolutely. So there, it, it, it follows in and plays in. And they have a couple of interesting episodes after that. They have uh, one where they're trying to assess a miracle. That was pretty cool. Um, but then the next one after that gets interesting. So... Townsend mentors a young man named Sebastian, telling him to embrace his hateful attitude towards women. (laughs) A team of assessors arrive from the Vatican to question the team about grace. That's the woman who was possessed uh, with them to show them access to the original codex. Oh, I'm sorry that she claims to have visions of it. That's right. She claims to have visions of it. This is a different woman. Uh, Parts of which Kristen illegally photographs. During her exorcism, a housewife named Bridget confesses to several murders while possessed by a demon named Howard. How, why is it that demons choose the most regular human names? I don't understand. I was just going to ask the opposite question now, because usually the demons have these really weird names in these shows. I like, know. This one is like Sh- Jim, yeah. John, George, Howard, George. Yeah. It's like, Wait, what? Yeah, yeah. I think it's because of its its personification, its humanization. I get it. I get it. But there's much cooler names out there. <laughs> uh, what's Corvin George? I, oh, you're right. You're right. Howard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, if you go back into just the Bible, the book of Tobit, right? Well, I'm sorry. You guys don't have book of Tobit. But if you go back to the Duke of Tobit, no, we don't. Yeah, we're Christian. You have Asmodeus, one of the ki- one of the one of the monarchs of hell. You have Asmodeus. How cool is that? <laughs> Shall not take away or add to to God's word. And yet, you Protestants did. <laughs> you sure? That's an episode, Keep right? Gloves on, boys. <laughs> How come you Protestants had to strip all those books out of the Bible? What a shame. <laughs> and choose not to put the ones that you have in the vaults <laughs> in. I mean, I'm just saying, even the original King James Bible contained these books. Mm. Oh! That's why I read the King James Bible. <laughs> I know. It's just easier not to know your history. <laughs> no, no, we're too busy actually feeding the poor and the hungry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Which church runs the most uh, the most charities? Oh, oops. Sorry about that. Just a victor goes the history books. <laughs> so oh anyway, <laughs> back to evil, please. Back to the demon oh, George. We're, we're, we're not. I'm sorry. Bad. The demon Howard. I'm going off to commercial break now. <laughs> Join us in part two for the rest of the conversation. 